the de broglie wavelength is given as lambda is equal to h by p where p is the momentum and h is the planck's constant now this can be written in terms of kinetic energy as see the kinetic energy is equal to half mv square and the momentum p is equal to mv so you can write the kinetic energy i am denoting it by k as p square over 2m now for the de broglie wavelength lambda can be written as h over root 2 mk now if you are comparing the kinetic energy of a proton and a neutron so given that both have the same de broglie wavelength so we can write h over root 2 say this is the mass of the proton the kinetic energy of the proton which will be equal to h over under root 2 mass of neutron and kinetic energy of neutron we know that the mass of a proton is approximately equal to the mass of a neutron so from this equation over here we can say that the kinetic energy of the proton will be equal to the kinetic energy of the neutron if their de broglie wavelengths are the same now if you compare carbon and silicon then you will find that both of them are in the same group both of them are in group 14 but say this is carbon and this is silicon now since it's placed one level below it in the same group that means it's in the next period so there is an extra shell now the four bond, uh, bonding electrons in carbon are present in the second orbit whereas those in silicon are present in the third orbit so the ionization energy will be less for silicon if the ionization energy is less which means it's more it's easier to free up electrons from silicon than from carbon so silicon has a higher conductivity than carbon the electrostatic potential is given by v is equal to 1 by 4 pi epsilon not q by r or kq by r so in this case you have to find the sign of the two charges q2 and q1 now the electric potential is a scalar quantity since it is a scalar quantity it will have a positive or negative sign depending on whether the charge is positive or negative you can see from the graph that the potential is positive for q2 and negative for q1 so in this case q1 is a negative charge and q2 is a positive charge next is this is positive next you have to find which of the two charges has a larger magnitude and why see to find the magnitude of the two charges we'll compare the two slopes you can see that v is plotted versus 1 1 over r so the slope of this curve would be v is equal to q by 4 pi epsilon epsilon not times 1 over r so if you look at this as y this as m so y is equal to mx this means that the slope is given by q over 4 pi epsilon not now comparing the two slopes you can see that this angle theta 1 and if you look at this angle theta 2 then theta 2 is greater than theta 1 since theta 2 is more than theta 1 the slope is more for q1 than for q2 this means that q1 has a larger magnitude than q2 so q1 has a larger magnitude than q2 since the slope is more for q1 than for q2 
See, actually in a compound microscope, what you see is a diffraction pattern. Say the specimen is placed over here and these are different points of the specimen. Now each point on the specimen will form a diffraction pattern. We need to find the minimum separation between these points which we will write as D minimum. So we need to find the minimum separation between these points that a clear image can be seen. That means the smallest distance between two points on the specimen that can be distinguished between. That minimum distance is given by 1.22 lambda over 2n sin beta where lambda is the wavelength of the light which is used to see this specimen. n is the refractive index of the intervening medium between the objective lens, this is the objective lens and the specimen, this is the specimen. The refractive index of this intermediate medium over here, in this case it is placed in air, but if it is submerged in some medium, then n would be the refractive index of this intermediate medium between the objective lens and the specimen. Now, what about beta? Beta is the angle made by the objective lens at this point which is its focus over here. I will just draw a magnified image of this point. See, I will just show this over here. Say this is the diameter of the objective lens and this is its focus. So the object is placed at the focus of this lens so that the image is formed at infinity and clearly visible. Now this angle over here is twice beta. So if we are going to use a diameter of uh, an objective of larger diameter, say this is an objective of larger diameter, then the angle made at the object, this angle would increase, which means beta would change. Now we'll answer this question. The first part asks that the wavelength is decreased. See, if lambda is decreased, then the minimum distance that can be distinguished will decrease or the resolving power will increase because the resolving power is the reciprocal of the minimum distance. It means this is 2n sin beta over 1.22 lambda. If the minimum separation is less, the resolving power is more. So, if lambda is decreased, then the resolving power, as you can see over here, the resolving power will increase since lambda is in the denominator. And the second part of the question is if the diameter of the objective lens is decreased. So if the diameter of the lens is decreased, if it is made smaller, then beta will decrease. So sine beta will also decrease, which means the resolving power will decrease. Over here, you are given the value of the temperature coefficient of resistance and you have to calculate the temperature at, the, at which the resistance becomes 20% more than its resistance at 27 degrees Celsius. Now, if you just notice, this is a 2 mark question, it is not a 1 mark question. We will use the formula over here for the temperature coefficient of resistance which is alpha is equal to R2 minus R1 over R1 times T2 minus T1. If you notice, this has the same form as the coefficient of linear expansion or surface expansion or volume expansion. It's final minus initial by initial divided by the change in temperature.
Now the question says the resistance becomes 20% more than the resistance at 27 degrees Celsius. Since this is given as per Kelvin, we will change this temperature from Celsius to Kelvin. Now let us assume that the resistance, the original resistance R1 at 27 degrees Celsius is 100. Since it is an increase of 20%, it is easier for us if we take R1 as 100. Then R2 will be 120. This is at T1 which is 27 degrees Celsius which is 27 plus 273 which makes it 300 Kelvin. Now putting the values into the formula we have 2 into 10 to the power minus 4 as R2 minus R1 which is 20 R1 is 100, T2 is the temperature we need to find out and T1 is 300. Solving this equation will give us a temperature of 1300 Kelvin.